and I'll be inside a different location, so I'm glad you're here. Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Todd Bierman, and he and I know each other from a long time ago because he worked at Camp Luther with me. 1983? 84? Probably, yeah. About 40 years ago. And we were both in college at the time. Hard to imagine, but we did actually go to college, and um, we. And his older brother was there too, Joel, who's a professor at the seminary. Shelley worked on staff that summer. My wife. Uh, I think who else you guys might know. But anyway, it was a fun summer. It was a good time. Uh, a lot of faith formation actually goes on there at Camp Luther. Absolutely. And also preparation for church leadership. Um, so anybody who, I always try to encourage the kids here when they're in high school, try to be a junior counselor for a couple of weeks. When you're in college, uh, yeah, okay, you can more, make more money somewhere else, but if you could spend a summer at Camp Luther, um, fantastic learning opportunity and you know maturity and all that kind of stuff. Plus you might meet a spouse like I did. And, and, like and I did. Oh, and you guys did. <laughs> Later, but back at Luther. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. you're at Camp Luther too? Uh, yeah. Oh. We were... Well, well, for a week. Oh, okay. We, we came back, and then she oh. worked at Camp Omega in Minnesota for uh, a summer. Uh, yeah. Know that one? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I was at uh, oh, I went to that Camp Omega in 80, 84 and 85 as a counselor there. Okay. And Heather was there in 93. 90, 93. Okay. 92. Yeah. Wife Heather. So... And I'm going to hand it, hand it over to you. And... All right. So all kinds of connections. Our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod is a small synod, and that's a problem and a blessing. It's a problem in that we should be growing and bringing others to the blessings we have. We want more to know Christ as we know him. It's a blessing in that we are a family, that you know everybody, and someone knows about you wherever you go. You better watch what you say and do. So that's a good thing, though, because we can care for each other as a family should. And uh, that's what we... Have been told in I'm supposed to stay behind this <laughs> here, so uh, I better get over here uh, with family there are many blessings many trials but in the end when you're part of Christ's family it's all worth it and that's what's most important of all and I've preached about that in first service if you'll be at late service you'll hear me talk about that there uh, but I'm from Concordia Center for the family it is an organization that uh, was started out about 15 years ago informally and became more and more formalized as an institute of Concordia University in Ann Arbor and Wisconsin and uh, Concordia Center for the Family then was started out primarily by Professor Ben Freudenberg who was a director of Christian education in our LCMS circles and who also uh, taught as a professor at Concordia University in Ann Arbor for many years and he was very focused on helping families grow in faith in Jesus Christ and to know how to follow him. And he was one who instructed future church workers to have that focus as well. As time went on, uh, the Institute grew and had connections internationally. I joined him in working in Ethiopia for two different trips that I went on. The last one of which was right as COVID was breaking out, we were coming home from Ethiopia and we heard about some stuff going on in China and they were starting to shut some things down in China and close some airports and stuff and we fortunately got back from Ethiopia and didn't get stranded there for the beginning of COVID. That would have been a pretty tough thing. Uh, but as I went on with Concordia Center for the Family during that COVID period, they trimmed back too. After they came out of it, Professor Freudenberg said, I'm just ready to kind of step back and do less. And uh, it's time for this institute to really become its own independent 501c3. And that's what they did. They applied during that slow time to get all the paperwork done with the government to become an independent 501c3, where it is an institute focused on building up Christian families. Then the next step was to apply to become an RSO of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, like Lutheran Hour Ministries or LWML or some of these other RSOs that are recognized service organizations that do work within our Lutheran Church Missouri Synod to help in various ways to build the kingdom of Christ. 
We applied for that and found out just last November that we were received as a RSO of the LCMS, so we have that status. We can serve in representation of the LCMS and, and have some other blessings of working with others in a like situation. The other thing that CCF needed was uh, some funding to really expand programming. Uh, the university was not providing any funding to um, CCF. Uh, when I say CCF, just remember that's my short way of saying Concordia Center for the Family. It just can be kind of long. So if you hear me say CCF, it's a reference to my organization, Concordia Center for the Family. So CCF uh, was looking for a way to fund for bigger things in store, and one of the things they did was applied for a major grant from... We had a request. Okay. Oh, Mike and you. All right. You don't have to use your complete pastor voice. <laughs> now I can use the radio voice. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to be with you at CCF Radio. All right. <laughs> See, I get a microphone and I just have to shift into that other gear. All right. Um, well, CCF, Concordia Center for the Family, then, we. Uh, were able to look for another way for a major funding assistance, and that was through a grant program <laughs> produced uh, by the Lilly Corporation. Anyone of you familiar with Lilly Corporation and medical care that they provide, medicines? Lilly out of Indianapolis, Indiana, is actually a very strong Christian-rooted organization. That Their corporation has always done much to give back to the Christian church. Uh, their found, founding um, family cares very much about the growth of the kingdom of Christ. And uh, they had a real heart for something they saw as a problem in our Christian churches in America. And that is the loss of the next generations. That the children just aren't staying in the church. They were hearing the statistics that were coming out from surveys. And so they said last year, and it's starting at the beginning of 2022, we want to do something to try to turn the tide on that. And stop losing the children. And so we are going to provide funding in grants up to a one and a quarter million each to as many as 70 organizations. So we applied for one of those grants and uh, they loved what we do at Concordia Center for the Family and said we would love to give you the grant. The only problem is if we give you that much money right now, it's going to affect your 501c3 status. You need to find a partner who has a few more assets already so that you can stay as a nonprofit. We partnered then with Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, who also agreed with what we are doing as something they wanted to be advancing in as well. And so, in partnership with the seminary, we did receive one of those grants. That came through at the end of 2023, and that gave the funding to CCF to be able to call me as a full-time director starting February 1st. So I've been in this position for a whole five months now and uh, as a paid position. Right now, I do have some income because of that grant, uh, but it is going to go away quickly as we start to expand our program, so that's why we're starting to look for other ways to sustain for the long term. And the long-term plan is one that is to reshape how we do things as the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, to shift our thinking, one of the flaws that we found that is so common in all churches, but especially in our Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, is we've got great church buildings with great pastors and great programs, and they do a good job of bringing up good Christian people. True. We have the word and sacraments of the Lord that are given in the house of the Lord regularly in our LCMS congregation. Fantastic. And you can go there on a Sunday and be enriched and blessed and tremendously strengthened in faith in Christ Jesus Wonderful. Nothing wrong with that. The problem is what you do when you go out the door. Do you put it into practice every day? Do you talk about it when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you rise up? Do you talk about it with your children around the dinner table? Do you even sit at dinner with your children anymore? Do you talk about it with your friends as you're meeting out in community activities together and sharing your faith and how do you apply your faith? Yes, we do it some but not as much as we could. And we find that that is where there is a little bit of a disconnect in the lack of that day-to-day -day growth that keeps the faith growing 24-7, not just on Sunday. To really live out our faith as Jesus did with his disciples as they walked through life and learned as they went along the way. And the focus that we have at CCF is to help 
churches see that their job is not to be the end all, but their job is to give every member tools to take into practice in the daily living and to equip you with resources and ideas and ways of living your faith at home every day, especially in raising children. For parents who are raising their own little ones in their own home, grandparents who are influencing their grandchildren and adult children, which, hey, you older members here, how many of you have adult children? Anybody here have adult children? Do they stop being kids? Do you have to still parent them? Even when they're like 50 years old? Do they still do foolish things and you have to say, what are you doing? I think they're parenting us. They're parenting you, yeah. And it shifts back the other way too. Where adult children have to start caring for older uh, parents and so on. Does the process of influencing others in the family ever come to an end? Do you ever retire from being a parent? Never. Can you ever stop influencing the children that you brought into this world? No, you have to be there for them and care for them and support them always. It's a lifelong process. And we need to see that, that as a family, we never stop caring for our family. We need to take that seriously 24-7. And so grandparents are very important. Our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, has a lot of congregations where the average age is in the range of like 75 years old. That's the average age. And uh, that was a statistic that I picked up on here recently, one of the district presidents was talking about. So how do we leverage that instead of bemoaning that? Instead of bemoaning it and saying, oh no, the church is dying. No, not at all. We have a wealth of wisdom and strong faith in a generation that is walking with the Lord in deep committed faith. Let's have them influence the next generations more. Put them in touch with those next generations more. Help them communicate more openly and freely. And we may say that, oh, the kids today don't care. They won't listen. They will. Especially the younger ones. They're hungry for stability and constancy and truth and reliability. Because how much do you see on TV that you can trust today? When you turn on the news, do you believe it all is being truth? Absolutely, 100%. Even reports from the government, do you believe that to be 100% true? Maybe least of all the government, do you believe it to be true? You have a hard time finding truth that's reliable. In fact, people honestly say, truth, eh, that's, a, that's a ebb and flow thing. You do whatever's convenient at the moment. You make your own truth. That is the common religion of man that's becoming most popular today. Truth is what I make it to be. Religion is what I make it to be. And it's an empty, shallow road that leads you to hopelessness and despair. That's why we see depression on the rise, anxiety on the rise, suicide on the rise, individuals walking as loners in a big world feeling like they have no one to turn to. It's because we've turned in on ourselves and we have no one to turn to to guide us and give us truth. We as Missouri Synod and Lutherans have that wealth of the truth of Christ and his word. We have it stored up in our older generations that can pass it on to the younger generations. That's what we want to capitalize on. And that's what I'm here to do with Concordia Center for the Family is to help us all to pass on this wealth to the next generations and keep them growing in faith. If you were at early service, you heard me share this sad statistic that just came out from a book from Mark Kiesling, who is with Youth Ministry in our LCMS, uh, Seven Practices of Healthy um, Youth Ministry. And in this book that was just published by Concordia Publishing House this year, the statistic is in there uh, that came out of extensive surveys that were done in our LCMS, that out of uh, every five children baptized into the Christian faith in the Missouri Synod, only one of them will remain in faith to adulthood. The other four will wander away mm -hmm. and not be active in the Christian church mm -hmm. into adulthood. 20% is so all. That's just such a sad, sad, sad statistic. How do we turn that tide? Well, in that book, they talk about what they find to really turn the tide is when adults invest in the next generation, starting with parents in the home, but other adult figures they can look up to. If you have five adult figures that you can look up to as a good model to you as a teenager who are Christians, that is one of the greatest factors that will keep you walking in the faith into adulthood. And that's in addition to just mom and dad. Mom and dad are important, especially dad, who really worships and is serious about it and is in church and actually moves his mouth and speaks the words and sings the hymns. That's a huge factor that influences the younger generations. 
It just is because they respect it that if you're there doing it, it must mean something. It must be important. And so we practice that um, in reality, it will change the next generation. So Concordia Center for the Family, working with Concordia Seminary, is doing something to turn the tide on this. And we work with the seminary because the seminary, uh, specifically Professor Mark Thompson, a good friend of mine, he's working on changing curriculum to focus on this attitude about how we do ministry. That we see the church as a partner with the home. That we give the home resources to carry on faith through every day of life. The church does its part with pastors and church leaders. The home does its part with parents and grandparents and caregivers who are equipped with simple tools to do it at home. So he's doing his part of the seminary. I'm doing the part, especially focusing on those out in the field. And together we're going to cover the whole spectrum. So that gives you kind of a big picture of what it's all about, what CCF is. Let me give you a little more detail, but now that I've got your attention and we are into it for a little bit and our stragglers are here, let me say a word of prayer, all right? Lord, I thank you for this privilege to be with these friends here in Anago, and I pray that you will bless us as we learn more of your love for us and how we can pass on your love to the next generations and keep them walking with you for eternity. May we unite together to make that happen more readily here in Anago and to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so you have that sheet in front of you with the PowerPoint and slides, and I'm going to refer to that a little bit. I may get off from it, uh, but at this first slide does have the contact information. Should you wish to be in touch with me and find out more, would love to talk with you. You can go to our website, concordiafamily.org, uh, which is the second half of my email there. Um, if you just uh, go to that, put that in your search engine, concordiafamily.org, you'll be able to find our website. It has a, a whole host of information, resources that are available. We have just opened an online store resource center where you can find some simple things you can use right away at home. Uh, we are all about giving resources to people that you can put into practice right now, today, in your home. So that stuff is on our website. Uh, the 800 888 number you can reach us to if you would like to be in touch that way. Um, so family discipleship is what we're about. Family ministry is what the church does to bring families into being cared for in the church. So the church ministers to families, <laughs> family ministry. Family discipleship is the growth that happens in the home where families have been equipped to make disciples of Jesus Christ. So keep that little distinction in mind. Family ministry done by the church to serve families. Family discipleship, the growth that takes place in the home as parents and caregivers raise up their children in the faith every day. Both are important, both essential. Uh, but too often our church is focused just on the family ministry side. We need equally to support family discipleship. And that's where I come in with this. So family discipleship, first of all, needed a definition. I met with the leaders of our LCMS uh, in our Board of National Mission last year, and they said, one of the problems we have is we just don't have a common definition of what this family ministry is, what family discipleship is. We just talk about family ministry, and people say, oh, we don't need that because we don't have any kids in our church anyway. What a bad attitude. And so I said, well, let's shift it a little bit and talk about family discipleship. And Jesus, did he... What did he make as he went along the road? He made disciples. He called his 12 disciples. They later became apostles, his sent ones, but they started as disciples, learners. That's what the word literally means, to be one who is learning on a regular basis. We are to be making disciples in our homes. So family discipleship is when Christ's gifts, his gifts, create faith in families and through families with church support. So Christ gives creating faith in and through families with church support. It's a short definition of family discipleship. It's getting Christ gifts into families so that they can grow in faith and then through those families to shape others around them to be disciples. But it all happens with the support of the church continually. We come back to receive the word and sacrament, to receive his gifts and the support of the fellow church members on a regular basis. They go hand in hand. Family discipleship is supported by the church. So that definition is one I shared with the leaders of the seminary, with our synod. They resonated, said, yeah, that puts it together pretty well. It's based on Matthew 28, 19, and 20, the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, doing what? Baptizing and what comes next? 
teaching, making disciples with the baptism in the church, and then teaching them every day. And what's it end with? Jesus gives the promise, surely I am what? How often? Always. always. He doesn't say, I'll be with you when you're in the church building. No, he <laughs> says, I'm with you always, out there every day, 24-7. So it's his gifts that come into us and then go out with us every day. And that is how we make disciples, remembering that. So that definition brings it together, what I'm talking about. Um, as you see up here also, uh, Martin Luther was one who really celebrated this. I mentioned this in my message. When he wrote his small catechism, he saw a need because this same problem was in his day too. Faith was not growing in the homes of the people, even in the clergy of his day. A lot of those clergy couldn't even recite the basics of our faith. Uh, to speak um, the Ten Commandments or the Lord's Prayer. Some of them just were not able to even do these basic things. And he said, we've got to fix this problem and get a simple resource that can be used by our church leaders and in the home so that as the head of the household, she'll teach it every day in a clear and simple way to his own household. That's why Luther wrote that small catechism. So what I'm about here at CCF is nothing new under the sun. It is what we are as Lutherans. We talk about the Reformation, it's when they got back to the Word of God and started using it regularly in the churches and in the homes. I'm saying it's time for that again in our LCMS, to have a Reformation again, to get back to who we are. I'm not creating anything new. I'm not talking about some new earth-shattering idea. I'm saying get back to our roots, back to Christ and what he did with his disciples, back to Luther and what he did with his followers in his day. We're doing the same thing again. Get back to what we are and do our job every day to make disciples of Jesus Christ with his gifts in our homes, in our daily lives. So, um, uniting family discipleship in daily activity, as Luther says, head of the family should do it every day. And we are that unifying partner to, to make this happen. Our logo expresses this. Um, you can see it on that flyer in front of you or right here on the screen. The logo is to represent this unity of church and home working hand in hand together. So if you break the logo apart, first of all, you can see there is a home in the background. The roof line that you see in the back is the roof line of a house. And that's where we really want the gospel to grow. So you're pulling out that roof line from the back to show a home. And what's the consistent piece that is in the top of the gable of the church that you see in the home? That window with a cross in it. And it's a golden window with the light of Christ. And it's like a sunrise. Uh, in our logo, if you look at it close, it's even a gradated kind of a, a brightening color like a sunrise. And we're saying it's time to have the rising of a new day in our LCMS where the light of Christ is shining in a brighter way again in the churches, but going into the homes. So you take that light that you receive in the church and take it into your home. And your home will be filled with that light. And from that light, through the windows that shine out to the community, that light will shine forth to others so that we influence the world. Talk about evangelism and how do we grow the church? There's been so many programs through the years of different ways to make the church grow, whether it's Kennedy evangelism or whatever it is. I conjecture, I was evangelism director for nine years for the SELC district, uh, had that job. And so I studied this and looked at it. The best thing I ever found was family discipleship. When families are living their faith authentically every day, they are the ones who will bring others to Christ. I can go out as a pastor in the community and say, come to Jesus. And they're saying, blah, blah, blah. They won't listen to me at all. They say, that's your job and you're one of those church people. But if my friend across the street comes over and says, how are you doing with your problems at home, man? What can I do for you? They'll listen. And when they see me struggling through life with the help of Christ, they're going to, how do you do that? What do you hang on to when you're having a tough day? That's the authentic witness that will change the world when we're living as disciples who are showing faith to the world around us. So this presentation today is also an evangelism presentation is what I'm getting at. It's also the key to our youth ministry. 
It's the key to our seniors ministry programs. It's the key to our stewardship programs. You want to see people who are ready to give of time, talent, and treasures to the Lord? It's those who are living it every day and they can't live without it. Everything we do in the church wraps around family discipleship. So this is not just a cute little thing for your little families. This is the heart of the entire congregation. It's the heart of our synod. It's the heart of the Christian church on earth. What I'm talking about right now. So that's why I'm so passionate about this. I spent 33 years in the parish, and this is what I discovered. It all has to come back to families that are growing in faith every day, or else you can talk to your blue in the face in the church, and if they don't go home and live it, it's not going to matter. It's living it authentically every day. So, building up the home with the church, so that gable, as I said, that's on the front of the logo, reminds us of the church building where faith is given through God's gifts, baptism, communion, his word. It's important there. The fellowship that takes place in believers just like they're doing here. So the church is important too. We work with both of those. And the church then supports the home, helps it grow, and then it flows back from stronger homes and stronger churches. We feed back. CCF grows stronger. We have the support of those who are getting it. And then we can influence more and more with one sole purpose, to make the light of Christ shine forth in all that we do. And then from that light of Christ shining in us to take it out to the world. So that his light will shine stronger in the church, stronger in the home, through CCF as we bring these things together. And we will bring the world to Christ. Evangelism, that's true evangelism. The gospel going out to the world. And in a powerful way, bringing more to know Jesus as Savior. So, you look at our logo, remember that. It's about church, home, working together to shine that light of Christ to the whole world. Concordia Center for the Family. That's what we're about. Okay. Um, I'm going to go on. Starting with Christ's gifts. It is starting with his gifts. If you don't have his gifts as a foundation, you can't do anything. So we go back to daily word, small catechism, confession and forgiveness in the home. How many of you practice daily confession and forgiveness in your own? Raise your hand. You may not recognize it as such, but do you ever say, I'm sorry, please forgive me? And then do you forgive a person and say, yes, I forgive you? That's confession and forgiveness, because the only way you can do that is not that you have the power to do it, but who's giving you the power to do it? Jesus himself. And he said we should do that. As you have been forgiven, so you also should forgive one another. That is something the world doesn't get. They don't understand it. Instead, if someone hurts you, what do you do? Do you forgive them? No, you get them back before they do it to you again. You get even. And so we practice a strange thing called unconditional love that forgives even when it's not deserved. And that's what Jesus teaches us to do. So it is this kind of confession and forgiveness that you can practice in the home that changes lives. And to show a child that you love them even when they mess up. Even when they turn away from you and that you will love them no matter what that kind of love is is strange in the world and it's so valuable anyway so another tool um and then praying out loud together any of you pray at home over meals have an out loud prayer over your meals together or at the end of the day great how many of you do impromptu prayers of just whatever's in your head out loud with the family fantastic and the number i just saw in here raising your hand on that is pretty typical the world over Maybe 10%, 20% do that. Why don't we do it more? Well, it's uncomfortable. I'm a German Lutheran from northern Wisconsin. We don't talk out loud about our faith. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. Hey, I grew up in northern Midwest. Uh, I spent 10 years in Gladwell, Michigan, which is straight across the pond from you guys, about the same distance north. That's how they were. And I spent three years working Camp Luther. And I know your folks up here in Wisconsin. My dad served at uh, Marshfield, near Marshfield in Granton and Chile, Wisconsin for 10 years, a dual parish. So I know the area. Lutherans are the same everywhere. Christians are the same everywhere. Why do what's uncomfortable to do? I don't like to talk out loud about it. I might say something silly and someone will laugh at me. It's embarrassing. Or I don't know how to do it. The way to do it is just do it. Heather and I have led marriage seminars all over the world. We started especially in Central and South America. Same thing there. Oh, we can't pray out loud. You're gonna, or else you're not leaving today. 
And so we would make the couples sit down. And we'd have the husband and wife sit face to face and take each other's hands and pray out loud together. And I said, and guys, it's your job to start it because that's the head of the household's job. So you just start the prayer. And if you say, I'm praying because I don't know what to do, Lord. That's great. That's a start. And then let your wife take over and pick up the mess and carry on. And, and just go back and forth until you run out of stuff to pray about. And they look at like shock in their eyes like, are you kidding me? No, just do it. We make them do it. And they start doing it. And they keep going. And they go 5, 10, 15 minutes praying out loud like that. And after we've done these marriage seminars, we've had so many couples that have come to us the world over and say, the most impactful part of the seminar was when you made us do that because we realized how much it brought the spirit in between us and we felt closer to each other than we've ever felt before. It was more intimate than all these seminars we went to about sex and marriage. This is what true intimacy is about. Opening your heart before God in open communion with Him, with your presence of your dear loved one next to you. That's the kind of thing that we can change the world with. And that's what you can do with children, too, in the home. Teaching them to do the same thing. To be open about talking about faith. Not afraid to say, I'm really doubting to God today. Why did he do this to my friend? Why did my friend get sick and die? It's not fair. I'm glad you're talking about it. Bring it out. Talk about it. It's okay to be angry. Look at what David did when he was upset. He wrote psalms all about that. It's good to talk about your feelings. And to share that in the home. We want to bring those things to light. And it's so valuable, so important to do. So um, we talk about it, we get it out loud. There are some other resources we can give you to help you with understanding how to do this. As I mentioned, Ben Freudenberg, who was the one who started Concordia Center for the Family, he wrote a book called The Family Friendly Church. It's a great resource on how we can shift from being church-centered with the homes all coming to the church, instead to shift it around and be home-centered with the church supporting it. And in that book, he talks about it. If you'd like to see a foundational book on that concept, it's a great one. And he wrote materials and developed a program, an extensive program that we now call uh, the Family Friendly Church Curriculum uh, that is based on the concepts of his book. And it brings those, those ideas to light in a powerful way. He also worked with another institute to develop what's called the Faith and Life Survey, a way for congregations to evaluate how are we doing with this family discipleship thing? Are we helping families to grow? Because we also have a real issue as uh, Missouri Synod, Louisville, well, anyone, I can just pick on us. We all like to assume the best in ourselves and put a better picture on ourselves than reality would warrant. You say, my home is perfect, it's doing great, we're all fine. Look at our homes, they're all great. Our church is great, we're friendly, we all come, we all smile, we're all having a great time. How deep does that health go, do you think? How many of the homes in this congregation have some real issues today? Is there any divorce in your congregation? Is there any single parenting going on? Are there grandparents who are doing more of the raising of their grandkids than the parents are? It's everywhere. There's hurt, there's pain. And the, re the way to address that is not to try to hide it and cover it up and candy coat it, but to be honest and vulnerable and say, yeah, we are sinners in a broken world, but we have Christ who loves us and empowers us to overcome that brokenness. So start by identifying it and bringing it to light, not being ashamed of it and afraid of it, but instead to overcome it with Christ's power. And so that's what this Faith and Life survey can help you to do. It's an anonymous survey, but it's given to the congregation where uh, you ask as many as possible in the congregation to take this 30-minute 30 30 minute online inventory. It's about all it takes, 30 minutes. You can go in and enter the data. And be honest, it's anonymous. No one will know it's your family that's messed up. So when you put in that stuff in there <laughs> saying, yeah, my adult kids don't go to church anymore. Boom, I'm putting that in there. All right, put it all in there, and then the survey results come back, and you can see what your congregation looks like in reality. Where are we doing a pretty good job? Well, we seem to have a pretty good job um, with this ministry. We're doing a pretty good job with our school. At least we're running the school. How many of those kids in the school are here every day in church or every week in worship? Anyone know here how many of your kids from your day school come here and worship on a Sunday? I was talking with Pastor Corollas about this, and he said, the special statistics um, are not real high, and the reality behind the official statistics is even less. Like this morning, first service, how many kids were at the children's message? 
two. That's not the way it should be. We should have these kids hungry to come and be here every day. But it's real. It's the way it is. So how do we overcome that? Well, this survey can help us to identify what are some things that are a little weak in our, in our ministry? What are some things we're doing well? What can we build on? And then CCF can come alongside after that survey is done and help <laughs> congregations take some steps forward. Build on your strengths and start to fill in some of the weaknesses. So that's a great resource that we have that was developed by an outside organization, but we are purchasing it now with some of those grant funds that I mentioned. It's costing us, in order to get that survey and make it our own tool, we're spending uh, almost $70,000 to purchase the rights and get all the materials and all the program and all that stuff to make it work. But it's so important to know yourself that we're getting that survey and the grant agency agreed. That's a great use of those funds to get that. So we're getting that resource, and because the grant is covering most of it, we're able to offer it to the first congregations that come to us at half the price of normal. So this is a great opportunity in the next couple of years if your congregation might be interested in that or you know other congregations that might. Talk to us. We'd love to tell you about this Faith and Life survey. It's a great tool that can be a, a good way to assess and plan for the future. So that's another thing that came out of the past with Ben Freudenberg, working with the Concordia University System, that's what CUS means, and uh, helping us partner with the seminaries, not only St. Louis, but we're working with um, Concordia Seminary in, in um, Fort Wayne as well, Theological Seminary there. Uh, Matt Wheatfelt is the director of their Christ Academy doing family ministry things. He's going to be our partner on campus working closely with Mark Thompson at St. Louis and several professors at Fort Wayne. I actually got my Master of Divinity at uh, the seminary in St. Louis and then I went back and got my Doctor of Ministry at Fort Wayne at the seminary there. So I could get a balance and know the good of both of our seminaries and get to know professors in both. And So it's based on those connections that I've had with those two groups that we can now build on that strength together because one of the other problems we have in our house, I'm telling you lots of problems, but because we can only get better if we know what our problems are. How many of you have heard of the difference between seminarians from Fort Wayne versus seminarians from St. Louis? Is there a difference? Does it cause problems? Does it hinder ministry? Does it cause cliques where some won't talk to others and they won't work together because of it? Those are some things that have flowed out of it. It's not, um, it's not a necessary that they have to be the same. There's value in both schools. I'm saying instead of worrying about our differences, let's celebrate what we have in common. We are both Lutheran seminaries trying to go back to the word and sacrament of Jesus Christ and get it out to the world. And there are good professors at both. There are good graduates from both. I have pastor friends from both institutions, and I love and respect them all. And we need to stop fighting with ourselves. And is there any conflict between, well, you're contemporary worship. No, we're traditional only, and we do it with an organ. No, we only do it with a praise band. And I don't care what way you use, as long as you're speaking Christ and you're helping homes to grow. Those children at home don't care whether it's an organ or not, honestly. Some would say, well, kids won't come if it's organ. Baloney. Children like the stability of something different and constant. And they actually appreciate the worship that is stable and authentic. They're craving that more and more. You look at the surveys that are out there. Kids are getting tired of the constant change that they're ever bombarded with. They're tired of TikTok that is just a clip, 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 clip here. Give me something that's a little substantial and stable in my life where everything else is just so fleeting and gone, including my parents, my siblings. Give me something I can trust in. Solid Lutheran worship, whether it's done with a contemporary praise band or an organ, it's just that it's on Christ and his gifts. We can celebrate our strength as the LCMS that way. And that's what I love to do is bring these sides together. And I've been doing a lot of that in the last year, talking to leaders in our synod, in our seminaries, in our universities, and congregations just like yours to say, let's all just start working together and pool our resources. If we can work together with other congregations, and it doesn't matter if you're a little small rural church or a bigger city church, we can all come together and build on our strengths. We can learn from each other and grow together to achieve this, this means, this end of getting more families with Christ. Uh, so, 
any rate, bringing it all together. My um, other thing I want to bring up is some resources that I've put together for simple, quick winning in, the, in this family discipleship idea. When I was going through my doctor of ministry, I saw the value of marriage and how it's a foundation to families. But it really went back to the key passage that was read in church this morning and will be used later this morning too, from Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. And it goes back to Genesis 2. It's repeated by Jesus himself. If you look in Matthew, um, when he was here on earth, Jesus said the same thing that his father said at creation. And it's this same passage about marriage. A man will leave his mother and father and hold fast to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, St. Paul says, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. So he's saying this whole teaching of marriage goes back to creation where the Father said it when he made Adam and Eve. Jesus reiterated when he was here on earth, said divorce, it's not meant to be that way. It's this way, and it's to be a lifelong union of one man and one woman. And then St. Paul reiterated the same thing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, saying this is the way it works. And so I took that passage and I said, we really need to understand, understand it well. And I exegeted it, took it apart, studied it, and applied it to life. And it really does bring out three key aspects of what makes for a strong marriage. It's based on the way that Jesus loves us and that he's married to us. And it's a love that has three parts. It is a love that is sacrificial, unconditional, and incarnational. Big words. But they stand for sacrifice, that I'm ready to give up just about me, myself, and I to care for someone else. Is selfishness a problem in our world today? Are there people who just live for themselves, me, myself, and I? All the time. So we overcome that by saying, look beyond yourself. It's not about you. It's about the people around you God has given you to serve, especially for us Christians. If it was just about you, God would take you to heaven. You'd be done with this world where it's all filled with garbage. But he says, no, I'm leaving you here because you're there to serve others. Sacrifice for others. So self-sacrifice is the first one. Jesus did it. He came to earth to sacrifice for us. Unconditional commitment. Hold fast. It will not change. We care for people even when they let us down. Even when our children wander from the faith, we don't abandon them. We chase after them. We keep going after them and praying for them. I don't care if your adult kids have wandered away from the faith. Don't stop caring for them. And don't give up and say, well, they're hopeless. Why bother? You keep pestering them and say, when are you going to come to church? How can I pray for you? What can I do for you in the faith? Where's your faith at today? Don't stop asking those questions. Keep on working at it. Let the Spirit keep working. You say, well, they'll get mad. So what? They're already mad. <laughs> right? You know? So make it worthwhile if they're going to be mad. Talk about what matters. Faith in Christ. Because that's what's going to matter when they come to the end of their days. And that's the thing you want to pass on to that next generation more than anything else. So... Unconditional commitment. The third part is the two become one flesh. It's that physical care that we must show in our relationships for each other in a positive way. Not the selfish lust of this world that's self-taking and making me feel good. I just want what makes me feel good. All this talk about transgenderism and abortion and uh, homosexuality. What's the root of it? What makes me happy? What makes me feel good? What makes me have what I want? It's all selfish. And it's abusing the physical world God has given us. Instead of saying your body is a temple of the Spirit to be used to serve others, it's my body to make me feel good. So I engage in sexual behavior that makes me have a momentary feeling of good. But it makes me feel empty if it's not done in God's way. Only in the context of marriage between one man and one woman is that physical union going to be of any value for the long term. Otherwise, it just disappears and it won't last. So we talk about marriage with sexuality that's practicing building each other up in true love. And that's the kind of relationship that is in God's way. So you have sacrificial, unconditional, incarnational love, three parts that make for a strong bond between a husband and wife that will last. And it also makes for every friendship that can be stronger when you practice it that way. Marriage is the ultimate form of it here on earth, but in any relationship, you have to have elements of that. So you can have a smaller triangle of those three balanced parts. I sacrifice to go and meet my neighbor, even though I know he's a drug addict and he's got problems all over the place. I'm going to sacrifice my comfort to go and talk to him, and I'm going to care for him even when he drives across my lawn and knocks my fence down. I still care for him, <laughs> unconditionally, and I'm going to take him a meal 
And I'm going to mow his grass for him and do things for his physical well-being to show that I care. When you show that kind of love, it's going to impact people. And it will change the world more than anything else. When you follow his model of those three elements of love. So I unpack that in my book called Handing Out Life. It takes these concepts and unpacks them in a way that people can grasp. Uh, so that's one of the tools I give to families to practice that kind of three-part love and explain that more thoroughly. The other tool I use, I mentioned in my message with the children, is a way to get your priorities clear in life. It's to put Christ on top. He's our number one relationship. He flows out down with his love to you, the palm of the hand, covers you with his grace. Even though your palm has scars and hurt and pain, he covers it continually, loves you unconditionally. And then he allows you to love the people in your life represented by your fingers. And the right order of priority Man will leave his mother and father and hold fast to who? Wife. Spouse is the number one relationship after that with Christ. You cannot care for your children or your parents or other family if you're not caring for your spouse first. It's when you have strong husband and wife relationship that you then have the love of Christ to pass on to your children and to adult, children, uh, to adult parents that you're caring for as you care for them and, and all the other people in your life. So you start with that family relationship with husband and wife first. And then children and family are important. You care for them unconditional. Even when they are messed up, you still love them. And then next is your church family. Because he does say you have to care for the household of faith as well. And we need that support. So you care for spouse, children, family, church family. Get those straight. And then that pinky finger wants to pop out. That represents everyone else in the world that you are to influence with the love of Christ. When you have your right priorities on top, his love will flow out to the world and you will be a witness of Christ. And you will be able to hand out the love of Christ. The opposite of it is when you turn things upside down and say, I don't need Jesus. Who needs Jesus? I'm going to work hard and I'm going to get money and I'm going to do the things that make me happy. The world stuff gets on top. And what's that do with our relationship with others? It puts up a wall. It divides us from other people because it's selfishness and self-focus all the time. And it turns things around. We've got to get it turned upside down and have that open hand that reaches out with the love of Christ instead of building those walls where it's all about me and my selfishness. The other extreme um, aberration of this right model of right priorities is when you say, don't need Jesus and my spouse, ha, forget her, she's gone. I don't care about her. Children, they have to take care of themselves. Church, who needs it? It's an empty place, just wants my money. World, I'll get them. And that's what it becomes, a hostile attitude. When you don't care about all those others, you're focused on yourself instead, it becomes a wall of hostility that reaches out with aggression. And we see that rampant in our world today. See that problem in our United States of America? How did we get through COVID with those kind of things? Were we able to reach out and love to one another? Or did you see people getting more and more agitated with each other and more and more hostile? And then come out of COVID more paranoid and saying, those people are the vaxxers and those people are the others and those are this. And we've gotten into all these camps where we're always ready to fight with everybody because it's all about me, myself, and I. Break that cycle. We can change that. We can. And we will when we let Christ remain where he's supposed to be to change us and to reach out through us to all these people. And if we can work on those priorities in that order, first of all, me with my Christ and regular worship and fellowship with believers, take care of my spouse and work on that relationship, and our children and our family and our church, and then we can reach out to the world too, and we will. So that's the other illustration that I expand on in, in some of my work. And those are the kind of simple tools. That works with a preschooler. Uh, I taught it in the preschool that I was involved with for the last 10 years at my church um, where we taught the kids, who's on top? Jesus. And they would get that in their head over and over to remember it so they could take it home. So these simple tools you can take with you and put into practice 24-7 as disciple makers in the home. So those are resources that um, we can develop and that's explained here on your PowerPoint. Uh, I wrote a whole series called the Life in God's Way series. It applies this concept to all the different situations you run into in life. Basic hope in a hopeless world. The fact that you are loved by Christ changes your whole worldview, helps you as family disciple makers in your marriage, parenting, preparing for marriage, retirement. There is really no such thing for a Christian. You don't ever retire from being a Christian. It just shifts where you spend your time and energy. 
Any of you who are retired that have found you're busier now than you ever were before? I hear that all the time. But it's doing things hopefully you can do by choice more and more. What more important thing is there to choose to do than influence the next generation to walk with Christ? So that's what retirement should be focused on. Um, dating, what is that? How do you do it? Life alone when you don't have other family. I recognize that there are homes where it is just one person living by themselves. Spouse has passed away, children are gone. Does that mean it's less of a family? Not at all. It's a family that is more united with the church family than ever before where you rely on your fellow believers more and more, and they can support you more and more, and we grow in that family relationship as a body of Christ should be. So you never have a, a relationship where you don't fit this model of family discipleship. Even the, the broken homes and the blended homes where it's his kids, my kids, our kids, and conflict in between them all, Christ is the one who can bind it all together. He knows how to do it, and he does a great job because it unites us in commonality. Instead of having saying, well, you're not my mom, I don't have to listen to you. Yes, but Jesus is your savior, and this is what he says. That's what brings us together in our families. So, strength in those relationships. So our approach is equipping Christian leaders with proven biblical framework of home-centered family discipleship. We're developing resources that we can get to church leaders, and especially focusing on um, the pastors and teachers, first of all, not because they're more important, but because they have access to take it out to more people. I can't be in every home of our LCMS or of the world, but I can get to more and more pastors all the time. And as I change their mindset and equip them, then they can go home and teach their congregations more and more. So pastors, teachers, day school teachers, DCEs, they're all important in this. So I'm really focused on them. And what we want to do is make more of them become CCF facilitators. These are individuals who've come to receive our basic training in a five-day intensive program. We're going to be doing one in the seminary in St. Louis next May, or next April, right after Easter, and another five days in Fort Wayne in May of next spring. And these pastors and leaders from around our church body will come in and receive training on these concepts I'm sharing with you today in depth over a five-day period, giving them deep resources that they can then take home and put into practice right away and even come as teams with other members of their staff so they can get a plan that's ready to go as soon as they get home. So that's where my real focus is on these facilitators who will take it home and facilitate family discipleship in their own congregation and influence other churches and um, Christians around them to do the same thing. So that's where I'm really spending my time, CCF facilitators, so we can get into the homes of our whole church body. Um, we also provide resources that can be used right away in the home. I mentioned go to our website. You'll see stuff that's already starting to show up there. Um, there's a lot of things that are available through other entities in our church body. We have links to those on our website. We'll be the one spot you can go to and then find these other resources that are out there that are already good. And we aren't the master holder of everything, but I can show you where to find it. And I would love to do that, help you have more resources to use in your own home. So that all families can be on fire with the love of Christ, growing in their own home, and then influencing the world with that light of Christ so that we will shine out and change the world. And it won't be just about us, but changing the world with Christ for the whole world to know him as their Savior. Making disciples, that's what it's about. Why? Because we want them with Jesus for eternity. Your own children, your grandchildren, all those children you see walking around you every day, we want them in heaven. I pray that you'll join us in doing so. If you'd like to find out how you can be part of this more with CCF, go to our website. You can sign up to receive our newsletter. I, every week I put out a little article or some news of what's going on, and it's just one email a week. Uh, or if you want to see our prayer requests, you can find those there, and we can send those to you. If you'd like to help out more in some other way or find out how you can be involved, please let us know. I'd love to talk to you about that. I have a sign-up sheet here if you'd like to know more specifically and you don't want to go on the website and mess with it that way, you can write it down here and give us your information. But the quickest and easiest way it is to go to our website and that information is on that flyer in the middle of the table. You might see one of these flyers there. It gives the quick summary of some of the stuff I was talking about today. And on the back, it does have our website and uh, contact information, including my personal cell phone on the back of there. So it's the quickest way to reach me. 
but it has some of the same stuff you just heard me share in this presentation this morning. So take that with you. Um, you're welcome to have that. And if you have questions, let Heather or I know. Heather would love to talk to you. And she knows as much of this as I do. She's with me all the way through it, and we do it together as a husband and wife. That's what makes me able to do this, is I have a wife who straightens me out when I mess up. So I'll go home and debrief after this today. What did I say when I was talking really fast in the middle of that group that I shouldn't have said today? And she'll point it out, and then I'll get better next time. All right, just a few minutes here. Questions from you or comments? Anybody? Thank yes. you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that these things are so important. Um, a couple things I, I had questions in my mind is what, how can you, when you have uh, a spouse that maybe is uh, spiritually, uh, has priorities spiritually, and one that has more worldly um, focus, how do you make the spiritual priorities look more appealing or get them more involved? Yeah, um, that's a common question. So if one member of the couple is walking with Christ and the other one's not so much, how do you get that other one to come on board and be more faithful? I say this mantra all the time. Rather than cursing the darkness, share the light. Well, listen to that. Rather than cursing the darkness, share the light. So instead of spending time, how do I fix him? How do I make him come to church? How do I get him to be a Christian? Stop dwelling so much on fixing him. Do all you can to walk as closely with Christ as you can every day, and it will flow over. Because then you're not spending so much time criticizing and attacking, and the one who's not walking with Christ will realize they're not being attacked so much. Instead, she's a lot happier than I am all the time. She's got friends that care about her. I want some of that stuff. And it may not say it out loud at first, but the Spirit will work on that. And that's how the Spirit can start to get into that heart and make a change. So what we can do more than anything, if we want to influence others around us, is I will walk with Christ faithfully myself, and I will pray for that person, and I will offer support to that person. I'll offer it to my spouse. If you want to come to church with me, you're welcome. I'd love to go with you. That's all you need to say. Don't say, you better get to church, you lazy. No, say, I'd love to go to church with you this week. I'll be there at 9, 8 o'clock, so if you want to join me. Just to celebrate the joy you have and let the world see it. It's the greatest thing we can What's that? Set an example. Set an example. Exactly. <coughs> Absolutely. To be Christ instead of preaching Christ down on people. Just to be Christ who loves unconditionally. Good. It's a good question. I know it's hard, though. That's why when you're in that kind of a situation, you need the church family, too. Who can You can go cry on their shoulder and say, I tried again today, and he still says no. I've been trying for 25 years to get him to come with me, and he's still saying no. And they say, well, I'll keep praying with you. And maybe one of those friends will be the one who sees Joe at the, at the grocery store or at the liquor store and says, hey, Joe, um, missed you at the men's club event last week. Why don't you come join us and then we'll just get together and play some um, dart ball. You guys play dart ball up here? That was a big thing over in Granton where my dad was, dart ball. If you haven't heard of that, that was a, I don't know, anyway. But whatever activity it is, get together and invite others to join you, to know the love of Christ. Another comment or question? You've been a great participating group. I've seen some good eye contact. It's so much better than people who are on their phone the whole time and not paying attention. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And can I say a quick prayer with you? Lord, I thank you for this chance to be with these wonderful believers in Christ, these fellow members of the family. Bless them and all they do here at peace and into the world, into Anago and into the world beyond. May we make disciples who are with you forever. In Jesus' name, amen.